Hi, my name is uh, Denise Hurley and welcome to Harmonies. Um, my guest today is Dan Navarro. Welcome, Dan. Hi, how are you? Good to see I'm you. I'm wonderful. How are you? I am good. You know, all things considered, I'm good. There's a lot of reasons why for any of us in our community, we could be saying it's awful. Mm -hmm. But um, I've kind of turned into a lemonade maker and I'm feeling pretty good. 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 So I'd like to uh, start off with perhaps one of your songs to, to get things going, if you don't mind. Sounds great. Sounds great. Let me, uh, oh, hello. I dropped my harmonica, Albert. <laughs> I've used that line more time than I, times than I care to admit out loud, and, and a 32-year-old understood the reference, which really cracks me up, from, from Simon and Garfunkel's A Simple Desultory Philippic, where he was doing a, a kind of making fun of Bob Dylan back in the 60s. Uh -huh. So this is off my, uh, the, the record I put out about a year ago, um, my first true solo album after years and years with Lowen and Navarro and a lot of years plying the boards, you know, on the mm -hmm. road, I decided to finally make a record and this is my favorite track on it. I had a dream, I flew like a bird to the top of the mountain and there you were Bathed in the shadows Alone in the dark With a lock and chain around your bulletproof heart Minute by minute Time after time Body to body Crossing over the line in each other a shower of sparks began to melt the ice away from your bulletproof heart somebody tell me please are we really here I opened my eyes and you disappeared and all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put the genie back in the bottle again Now I try to remember To try to forget The way it felt that night But it ain't happened yet One perfect kiss Blew the shackles apart To keep you locked inside Your bulletproof heart Somebody please tell me please what's happening here The image is hazy but the memory's so clear And all the king's horses and all the king's men Can't put the genie back in the bottle again So where are the fault lines? How deep are the ties? And can I ever touch the fire I see in your eyes? We can come together, or we'll come apart. But I cannot come away from your bulletproof heart. Your bulletproof heart. said and did won't happen again so how do we finish where do we start to break down the walls around your bulletproof heart your bulletproof
Very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> it's a little bit of a true story. Um, oh, okay. Of, of events that took place. I mean, I, it's, it sounds like comedy and it kind of is, but it's the, the true story is that this uh, recounts events that took place um, between a former swimsuit model and a Mercedes S600 um, <laughs> that had bulletproof windows. And what started out, I mean, it sounds absurd, but it's true, but what started out a song about an encounter in a bulletproof car sort of morphed. And, um, you know, we get these gifts. This is what the job is, is to be, <laughs> is to be uh, antenna for the gifts as they fly by. what I love about it most, in fact. All right. Um, when we first met, I think I met you and Eric at Falcon Ridge Folk Festival. Mm -hmm. I think it was the first time. Um, I know that we've listened to, G and I were listening to your music way before that, but it was really great to meet you when we did at Falcon Ridge. And then we had the honor of having you guys come and play at their music series, right. which was so much fun to do. So I just wanted to mention that because uh, we've known you guys for a long time. Well, it's, been, it's been some time now. And actually, I think, did I, unless I'm mistaken, I played it twice, once with Eric. And mm -hmm. then I did it once solo in a co-bill with Robbie Schaefer from Eddie from Ohio. Yes. And I have to say that that show, uh, I think that was 2006, was my first solo tour. Eric had not retired. Now, for those who don't know, Eric Lowen and I were partners for over 25 years, and he contracted Lou Gehrig's disease in early 2004, uh, retired in 2009, and passed away in 2012. Well, I went solo at the very tail end of 2006, and coming to Lancaster was my first solo tour. I remember, I yeah. I was terrified. You were terrified? <laughs> what really? am I going to do without my other half? And mm -hmm. it was it was a, a serious learning experience. I was grateful to have Robbie Schaefer on hand because we were old friends, but yeah. uh, it, was, it was terrifying. And since then, we now flip wipe to 14 years down the road. And although I have, of course, been uh, per paralyzed by, you know, to public touring, I've been streaming uh, up this week is my first week of only three days a week. I've been streaming six days a week. Uh, you have, yesterday yeah. was performance number 134 since March. Wow. Uh, and I've basically done a thousand shows solo since that first tour. It's, um, you know, the fear is gone. The doubt is gone. I love doing it. And of course, Eric is gone. And, yeah. and uh, yeah. the permanence of him being gone kind of made parts of it easier. You know, it wasn't like we broke up. Um, you know, he passed away and that made it in many ways easier to deal with it because there was no questioning it and there was no, but what if, or, well, maybe, maybe we, none of that. Uh, frankly, I would um, have long conversations with Tracy Grammer about the same kind of issue. Our situations were different. Uh -huh. uh, she and Dave Carter were significant others and he died very suddenly. Eric was a prolonged end and of course we were music partners, but still the notion of there's this other person that's always right. there and then they're not. Yeah. So we related pretty well. Yeah. Well, so, so you've been touring right. before everything shut down. Um, and you've been, it's been what, over 30 years that you've been touring? The, I started touring in May of 1990. It's just over 30 years. Okay. We're into the 31st year. And, um, okay. you know, I don't know when I'm going out again. I know that I will. Um, yep. This is not something, uh, you know, income notwithstanding, I frankly love the road. I love meeting people everywhere. I love seeing this country on the ground. Yeah. I love the ability to become familiar with places and that I, you mm -hmm. know, I grew up as a child. I never traveled. My father had the kind of business that did well in holiday time. So we never traveled. I didn't start traveling a little in college. I did, but I didn't start traveling in earnest um, until I was in my twenties and didn't really hit the road until Lowen and Navarro started. And I was in my thirties when Lowen and Navarro started. Oh, okay. So it's been, it's been 30 years and I'm, let's just say, uh, over retirement age and uh, <laughs> I 
And mm -hmm. so it's, it's been a 30 year trek. I have no intention of stopping, no interest in slowing down. I don't sure. think, I think the big, uh, you know, undecided fact and un in, indetermined factor undetermined is what's going to happen when the red light, when the green lights back on, will I still like it? I suspect I will. Yeah. But you never know. I mean, I am orienting toward doing different things now. I'm, you know, I'm, again, the streams have, have become a tremendous substitute for, uh, you know, for the live interaction. It's not the same. It's right. not, it's not the same. Right. Um, but I'm trying to actually imagine touring without hugging. <laughs> the reality for the first year after we start again. Right. The socially distanced touring, even with a vaccine, even with, yep. you know, salad bar plexiglass in front of us, which <laughs> my son sent me a picture of somebody in Newport, Rhode Island, um, behind a glass partition. And I'm sitting there going, I don't know, man. Really? I, I, almost, I, I don't know. It's not. To me, it's about meeting people, touching people, um, right. you know, becoming uh, familiar with them and they with me. Um, you know, I, I have um, strict boundaries. Mm -hmm. That said, my strict boundaries are in some ways a little looser than some artists, especially the bigger artists who really yeah. can't, can't let their fans near them because they don't know where the boundaries. And, you know, but I have, I have touchers and weepers and, and, um, and you know, was it uh, TMI people? And I have all of that. And it, <laughs> it's heartening. And when it gets weird, it's amusing. I have literally only had to draw a hard line with maybe four people in 30 years uh -huh. to say, you know what, you need to take a giant step back. But other than that, I tend to deflect most of it with humor. Um, and, and the notion that with, with any luck, no one can make me do something I don't want to do. With any luck. <laughs> Um, okay, what, what does it mean to you to be a musician? What, you know, I've been a musician in some way or another since I was um, eight years old. Okay. I started taking trumpet in school at eight. I played in the school bands all through junior high school, high school, and college. I started singing publicly in men's choirs in college. Oh, I started okay. singing in, um, you know, folk clubs and such, steak houses, bars, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, um, in my very early 20s. And it's really been, you know, I think it may have started out of a means of trying to get some attention. But it was really about the, the, um, the physical energy of music when it courses through your body, it is vibrations, it's acoustical vibrations, uh, with or without lyrics, that resonate with your body when you execute with your hands or with your voice, or something like that. And you know, whether you're blowing into an instrument, striking an instrument or singing, these vibrations go through your body. I remember vividly, the feeling of my first concert band symphonic wind ensemble and the entire group played and I'm in the middle of it. And it's like, wow, because it wasn't just all around me, it was inside me. And I was also making sounds contributing to it. Taught me the nature of harmony, taught me the nature of um, following leaders, taught me the nature of teamwork. And it particularly taught me the nature of abstract expression. Because okay. music is, is ephemeral. It doesn't look like anything, it, you mm -hmm. can't touch it. It's sounds and we ascribe meaning to those sounds without lyrics. But I mean, why does that sound sad compared to compared to that? Why does that sound weird? And these are things that the emotional responses that we get that have no basis in reality. Or do they? And I think that's the thing I love about it is the fact that music forces you into a sense of yourself that is not all about the one-to-one -one relationship with time and space. Mm -hmm. It is abstract, it is spiritual, it's emotional, mm -hmm. it's physical. Yeah. And to get to do it puts me in sync with whatever it is that happens to be going on uh, in the world or around me in a given moment. To share it with people and have their reactions happen or to make music with people, especially when you don't know what you're gonna play and you gel and you look at each other going, 
who did that? I didn't do that. Did you do that? It's like a Ouija board. Nobody knows who made it work. But when it happens, mm -hmm. nothing touches it. And I've acted and I've painted and I've drawn and I've written prose. And yeah, I've done graphic design. They're mm -hmm. all cool. They're yep. not music, not to me. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um. So what has been your inspiration for your songwriting uh, recently? Recently, um, you know, I was going to make a joke until you said the word recently. Um, <laughs> well, you can, you can still for me, make it's a joke. Been abject pain. It's been trying to mollify, understand, express, release uh, trauma, whether it's the emotional <laughs> okay. trauma of a loss um, or even a sense of joy that is bec because of its sort of animated nature can be traumatic in quotes. It's a good trauma, but it can be jostling. So from that standpoint, um, music was designed to bring the expression, release, and peace. Um, what it's been lately is to, again, to maintain engagement and connection with a larger mm -hmm. world. And also to try to understand these changes that we're dealing with right now. I mean, mm -hmm. we are in a, a once a century uh, sense of upheaval everywhere. Right. And nobody knows what it's going to look like when the pieces settle. Right. We have ideas, but nobody really knows. Right. And that part is, it's terrifying in some ways. It's awe-inspiring might be a better way to put it because it can also mm -hmm. be invigorating. But I'm not... I'm not thrilled about a lot of what's going on. And I think a no. lot of people in our community feel the same way. Uh, it's not as simple as a gentleman in the White House or anything. Many, many changes are occurring in our world that are untenable to a generation. And the question is, how much of them will resonate beyond this generation? How much of them will my, ch my son's generations look at me? Right. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Especially considering, you know, the things that changed in my generation compared to my parents. My father would be 101 if he were still alive. My mother would be, uh, she passed on mm -hmm. quite some time ago and she would be 93 yeah. if she were still living. So they've seen things like, I can't believe you do that. I can't believe you say that. People who can't believe you can say ass on television. When we were growing up, when I was growing up, you couldn't. No. And it's not as simple as that. Yeah. But the notion of experiencing, living through, uh, understanding, and in particular, navigating change is something that that's, that's something I um, write about and write yep. into uh, a lot. Yeah. So, it's been, it's so been. do you think this was something that, I mean, I hate to say it, but it, it, it's something that we needed to have happen to really change how we live and how yes, we treat yes people? I think some of the evolutions were necessary mm -hmm. as we as people changed. I think some of the ugly going on right now was unnecessary. Okay. Um, and speaks to a semblance of dissatisfaction that was coming from a segment of our population. Mm -hmm. But I think to a great degree, it also speaks to how spoiled we've become. Okay. That we expect certain things to be a particular way when we're dancing in the streets and don't even know it. Um, and so whether we can turn the clock back to the 1950s and create a sense of the world that existed at one point in time uh, is open for debate. There are many in this world, not just this country, trying to do just that. Others that are trying to catapult us into the future, possibly even before we're ready. Um, a whole bunch of us that are sitting there going, uh, let's just be here now and figure this out. And all points in between. Um, I think certainly most giant social movements that have resulted in uh, monumental change needed some sense of crisis and some sense of breakdown right. to, to come to fruition. Uh, I think the lack of civility and the nastiness and the polarity in our world mm -hmm. is not something that needed to happen. I think the energies around social justice did because it's about blinking time. Um, you know, it's amazing that it's taken 160 years yeah. to, 
to get anywhere close to where we need to be. And that the whole idea was great. Well, we did that 160 years ago. Now let's just push all these people off to one side as we continue with business as usual and give them the illusion of justice. It's, it's a tough one. And I'm, you know, obviously I'm, fair, I'm fairly left wing, although centrist by nature because it's from a practical standpoint. But um, the big social changes, they needed to happen a long time ago, and I'm glad they're happening now. Um, now, Shed My Skin, is that your latest CD? That's my latest. Um, I put it out to our community two years ago, and I put it out to the world a year ago. I actually only played it at shows, only sold it at shows, and on my website uh -huh. for a year. Um, it wasn't on any of the services like iTunes or Apple Music or Amazon or Spotify or Deezer or any of those. I released it worldwide in March of uh, 2019. So it's, it's now really, as, as far as the, most of the world is concerned, it's a year old. And I've got enough songs for a new one. I don't know how I'm going to record it. I have an idea how I'd like to record it. But frankly, with everything that's going on, how do you convene to, to record? Um, I'm, I'm a, a board member, a national officer actually in SAG-AFTRA, the um, yep. merged entity that was the Screen Actors Guild and, and AFTRA, the, the mm -hmm. TV radio recording union. And I've been part and parcel of, the, of creating the protocols with which we go back into production around humans. I actually did a session two days ago for a television okay. series in a studio, engineer gloved, masked, didn't touch me. I didn't touch anything. All the doors were open and were closed for me. Um, I could have brought my own FET headphones. The receptionist was behind plexiglass like a salad bar and um, took my temperature upon arrival. Mm -hmm. I had to fill out a questionnaire indicating if I'd had anything remotely resembling COVID symptoms. Uh, but it was nice to get to work in a yeah. studio setting. But it's not, it's not easy. There are <laughs> protocols now. And... Um, and some of those might never go away. Right. I somehow believe that we may never see a day where there isn't a hand sanitizer machine at the mm. door to every public place. That something tells me that's going to be permanent. I mean, first of all, they've been purchased. They may as well be used. Hmm. Right. Um, right, well, going into uh, your other world, as a voice actor and singer, um, are, you, are you able to do that now? Are you able to do any of that type of work? Is that uh, available to you? Tell me that one more time. I'm sorry, I got slightly distracted. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. Um, you're that's a, a voice you. actor. Uh, you know, I am able to. I'm lucky that way. Production okay. is shut down for on-camera actors and it's just barely starting yep. to get started again. Um, my work as a singer in film has stopped, but I have been doing unidentifiable noise voices um, called Walla on Family Guy and American Dad for 20 years. Okay. And I've done 16 episodes here at home in shutdown. I've been doing voiceovers for commercials, and I've done six here in shutdown over the last five months. Um, I just delivered a commercial Monday. I just did my last episode of Family Guy delivered yesterday. Again, Tuesday, I had this session for another series. So I have been able to work. And that part has been heartening because it's not, I'm, you know, I've, also because of my songwriting, I have a royalty stream that is actually quite good because uh, of the it's, big Yeah, good. The big Gigantor hit keeps on providing. So I've done better than most. Um, which is one mm -hmm. of the reasons, by the way, why I'm streaming for engagement, less for money. I tell people, I don't, you know, send me money if you want to, but I'm not. My, yes, I've lost thousands upon thousands of dollars in bookings. Sure. But I'm okay. And a, yep. lot, of, a lot of the people watching and listening are not okay, yep. have been furloughed or have been laid off or are looking at, you know, fixed expenses and no income. So, uh, but I have been able to work. It's been, it's been good. And it's starting to ramp back up, but... You know, the real issue is that it's now quite cumbersome. Uh, we're talking about on-camera, it's on-set actors uh, tested daily. The people in their immediate mm -hmm. vicinity all masked and tested daily. 
the creation of three zones, zone A, zone B, zone C, and in terms of how close you get to the actors, no guests on set or in the studio, period. Right. Cleaning everything. The testing alone is costly for the producer because the producers are maintaining these costs. So it's, it's a lift. But the two things that come into play, one of them is, is um, yeah, but would you rather produce or not produce? And the other is, do you want to be the producer that kills the first actor? And nobody really wants to do that. So they're doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to remain to be seen how it, how it plays out. And how it plays some, out. Are, some are thinking they can escape it by producing out of the country. Uh, but unlike other problems, whether it's, you know, 9-11 or Hiroshima or earthquakes or floods or anything, this is global. This is everywhere. Yeah. And nobody's escaping this one. Um, so, so how do you, how do you see the evolution of the entertainment industry because of this? Uh, well, I think you talked a little bit about it, but. Right. The, um, you know, it's the key phrase that everybody's using these days, the new normal. In mm -hmm. terms of large-scale concerts, um, they're going to be difficult to distance. I mean, the notion of a 15,000-seat arena holding 4,000 people uh, right. is economically not feasible without raising ticket prices to 500 bucks a pop for the, for yeah. the nosebleed seats because the economics aren't there. Everybody's going to be taking a hit. Small venues, you know, like... Uh, like the series, um, it's a tough one to take a room that holds 100 people or 150 people and reduce right. it to 40. Uh, again, the economics come into play. I think that once we have effective therapies and possibly a vaccine that has soaked into the uh, populace to the point where it's not just, you know, been rolled out a week ago, but has had a chance to become tracked with regard to its effectiveness and, and a s large segment of the population using it, uh, it's going to change a bit. But if you've got an audience with 100 people, you don't know if 30 of them have refused to get the vaccine and what they're bringing in with them. Right, um, right. You know, it's, you and this know. is different. I have, I have done shows with a cold. I mm -hmm. have sessions with a cold. I have told people, you guys, I mean, actually, a lot of times I've kept it to myself because I don't want them to catch on. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, many of us have, have gotten what is affectionately known as the folky flu at Folk Alliance from close proximity, mm -hmm. uh, thousands of people, um, lots of hugging and kissing, and mm -hmm. nobody getting any sleep. But, right. So all of these factors will continue to come into play. I think the future of the industry is going to remain online for some time to come. Okay. I don't think what we're doing right now will go away, even if things improve out there. First of all, in some ways, it's too easy to extend the reach way, way beyond your boundaries. Mm -hmm. and the idea is if we can create intimacy, if we can create engagement, uh, if we can you know, improve the production values. Uh, you know, I started streaming. I, I had been streaming a single song every three or four shows from the road for about three years. I'd okay. be, you know, here I am at Lancaster Coffee House. Here's a song. Boom. There are 7,000 people here. People laugh and cheer. And then I'd move on and do it a few days later, not the very, not every show. March mm -hmm. 15th, I woke up and said, I got to start streaming. And I wasn't aware of the fact that I was not the first to think of it. I did one song, yep. uh, got a couple thousand views, and I said, well, I'll see you tomorrow. And I did 30 minutes. And I go, well, I'll see you tomorrow. And I did 90. The next day, I did two hours, and it turned into six days a week for five months. Um, wow. 35 episodes which wasn't really my original intent because sure. what I was getting back from people was not good to see you. I've missed you or great music or you sound good or you look good. What I was getting was we look forward to this all day. You're saving my sanity. You're mm -hmm. saving my marriage. Mm -hmm. I'm going crazy without showing up every single day to see you. You're something to look forward to. You're something to depend on. And all it really did hit me what's different about this compared to market driven vanity driven i'm going to stream it's not as simple as that and the toothpaste will not go back into the tube 
This is important for us to continue to do to extend uh, our reach way beyond our borders, mm -hmm. physical, personal, uh, community borders. Right. Um, and I think like any entity that deals with what happens when allowed to commune after a long period of, of want is I have a feeling that live shows will become more vibrant than ever. This mm -hmm. will not go away. And when that finally comes back with the ability to truly commune, it's going to be just, I mean, you'll, you'll have people weeping openly, in my opinion. I like, I actually like the idea of the, the, the both mediums happening together. And like you said, it, it's a bigger reach to people, you know, um, when you stream across the globe. Mm -hmm. And I find that it's a, it's a way to bring us all together as one, exactly. you know, and I, really, I do like that idea a lot, but I do miss having my shows. <laughs> well, I, I don't blame you. And, I'm, and I miss doing them. I've got yeah. to say, uh, yeah. I mentioned earlier, I didn't blow out the whole year at once. I've been canceling a, a given month about yep. three weeks out, just in case some new development happens. It makes me go, right. okay, let's go. And the new development, I was ready to do uh, the Northeast for five mm -hmm. days and in, in August, and then uh, and uh, two shows in the Chicago area. Yep. And both the state of New York and the city of Chicago said, if you're from California, you need to, to quarantine for 14 days. Right. And I didn't have the time. Then I found out, well, okay, if I've been out of the state of California, not staying more than you know a few hours passing through a, a restricted mm -hmm. state and i can prove with gas receipts that i left california they said then you won't need to quarantine which meant that i had to leave two weeks before my first show oh, either in yeah, an airplane yeah. and hide someplace or in a vehicle and take a week to cross the country and then a week to sort of hunker down it wasn't worth it right. not just for economics but in, in terms of use of time you know, I would have brought my streaming gear with me, but that's kind of not the point is, uh, yeah. is that it just became too big a lift to try to fit it in. September, right. three shows in the Minnesota area that I've done, house concerts that I've done around Minneapolis uh, for 11 years. And yeah. they're, quite, uh, they're quite vibrant. They're profitable. They're engaged. They're fun. And everybody's disappointed, but they were all saying, good move. It's just yeah. not. And they were backyard shows, but they go, you know what? It's just not. Worth yeah. It. Right now, so, I have one show scheduled for October that may or may not go. I have the Northeast scheduled for November. Two of them have already been canceled. Mm -hmm. venues. So it's not looking good. Yeah. So it means that we're going to be doing this for a while. Someone's going to go to number 100 million, you know? And, yeah. uh, well, thank you for doing it. Thank you for uh, performing and um, lifting folks' spirits. I think that's wonderful. So, um, so how do people tune in to your concerts? What, and I'm, to doing, what I'm doing right now is um, I'm streaming on three different platforms on three separate days. I was initially doing only Facebook Live until mm -hmm. the July. Through July and August, I was multicasting to Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. And what I've discovered is that everybody went to their familiar place and the other two, the, the Facebook, I mean, YouTube and Twitch were not really getting much traction. Oh, okay. So I'm making it complicated, but you can always go to my Facebook music events page to see where I'm going to be. They're very consistent. Every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern time on Facebook Live. Every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube Live. And every Saturday uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and I do it earlier so that I can get some some viewership in Europe on Twitch, which is a gamer site that's yeah. relatively new, but they're doing a very robust, not just music aspect to what they're doing, but they're doing a very robust um, series of, of fan engagement uh, exercises, points you can you can accrue that give you a special status, paid requests and things oh. like that. Um, most of my friends, many of my friends are using Patreon and I may investigate that. But right now, mm -hmm. Monday's on Facebook Live, 8 p.m. Eastern. Wednesday's at YouTube Live, 8 p.m. Eastern on the Dan Navarro channel. And Saturday's at 2 p.m. Eastern at Twitch on Dan Navarro Music. Okay. And um, it should be pretty easy to find. Uh, I'm going to, I'm asking, asking the audience to caravan with me from place to place. 
going to give it a six week try, see how that works. If that doesn't work, I can just go back to Facebook and do it. I just Facebook. Okay. And I'll probably store them up on my website. Um, okay. Everything's in flux, but it's all good. <laughs> all right, Dave. Well, thank you so much for coming on my show. I really appreciate it. Um, so good to see you again. And uh, could you play one more song for us? Well, can I play a half a song for you too? Just something Absolutely. Like yeah. We all know the world is in the pits Sometimes I get so sick of it I only want to find some friends who fit So I'll hang out with Jean and Louis Denise In watch you sits <laughs> I almost called you Louise Which is all side <laughs> all would like that But that was, you know I get silly, um, and the silliness is in, the silliness is intentional because I know that my songs are poignant. This is a newer song that'll end up on my next record that I'm particularly proud of right now, mainly because it explains why I'm an older guy. I don't have to do this. Why? Mm -hmm. this is why. <laughs> I sit too long the television starts telling me it's my friend when the air goes still it starts feeling like the end and then the world calls out a wind whispering baby I got something new it's a siren song that beckons me to move no, I can't slow down, my wheels are turning Don't matter if I'm wasting time I'm gonna set my sights on the next horizon line Well, I've been chasing dreams Like they were oxygen Feeding these fires at night They're gonna light my way between the thunder and the tail lights, the red tail lights. Yeah, I can't slow down, my wheels are turning. Don't matter if I'm wasting time, I'm gonna set my sights on the next horizon line. Yeah, the past is gone, but I'm still learning. Ain't hanging on a dollar sign. I'm gonna set my sights on the next horizon line. Yeah, I'm the drifter and the driven, unforsaken, unforgiven, burning brighter, burning down the house in one more town. There's a clear blue sky out there waiting on this mountain's uphill climb. And the cold black clouds that are tracking me will fall behind. So far behind, yeah, I can't slow it down. My wheels are spinning, no matter if I'm wasting time. I'm gonna set my sights on the next horizon line. Yeah, the past is gone, but I'm still living and hanging on a dollar sign. I'm going to set my sights on the next horizon line.
Thank you so much. That's why. <laughs> Just saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dan, well, again, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you I wish you the best of luck. And maybe I'll see you on the road sometime, huh? I think so. I know so, because, again, I ain't stopping. But um, I right. love to you and love to Jean, and I look forward to the next time. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was fun.